all the friends and family that are going through incredible health challenges and they may be tempted to give up but they find value in seeking our Lord, seeking his cross whether it be to the restoration of their health or to the finishing of their life in a happy death we pray for our nation that all the areas of division may be healed, placing ourselves under the Holy Trinity unambiguously let us stand for God and he will bless our great nation may he restore Christendom may the people who are lukewarm and unbelieving awake and bow to their true king our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Now, Mary, for the grace of the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, as now, and it shall be, world without end. Amen. The rest eternal grant unto them, O Lord, and let thy perpetual shine upon them. May the souls of the faithful heart rest in peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Today, we hear the story of the Transfiguration. And there's a temptation, as the modernists do, chalk it up to some bad fish or something Peter ate, and that he was just a it was just some sort of vision they all had in their head collectively. But nothing could be further from the truth. This was a miraculous intervention to our Lord's closest collaborators here on earth, Peter, James, and John. And that wasn't by accident either. And in the, what they call a theophany, a revelation by God, so Moses had one and this is one in the New Testament, where it is very unambiguous that God the Father speaks. What an amazing event this would have been for James, Peter, and John. Going, oh my goodness. Because of course they knew our Lord was very special and of the Father. But this underlined it in an entirely different way. An entirely different way. Beyond, you know, healing somebody or raising them from the dead, even even his great miracles, here is an unambiguous proof that the source of all of this great story that we learn about in the gospel is the Father's will. And that is an amazing thing in itself. When you think for a moment, some of you might have a goldfish or something at home, or at least had one. Have you ever thought what it might be like to be the fish? The fish doesn't know you have a car out in your driveway. The fish doesn't understand that you had to go to the pet store to feed it. The fish doesn't understand that you have to pay the electric bill. The fish doesn't understand what rain or sun is in the way that you do. Even if it had human intellect, it would not be able to understand all these things because it has no means of understanding the world outside that tank. It swims in the water. But let me suggest to you that we are like the fish in this respect. We swim in time. We swim in time. And we experience everything from the environment of time. But God is outside of time. And it's a mystery. How can we be both outside of time? Because see, when you create it, even our, even our physics, our modern physics will tell you that if I have this piece of paper in a vacuum, time exists because the matter exists. We have a linkage. Time and matter, you see. And the beautiful thing that that confirms, as our holy faith teaches, is that all of creation is part of the same fabric. It has the same creator, even time itself. Which is why, to God, in some respects, you have never been born. In some respects, you always are right here in this moment, in this church right now. And in some respects, you've been dead for a hundred years. And or the, the second coming's already happened. And it's a very hard thing for us to get our heads around because we're a, swish, a fish swimming in the aquarium. We don't understand. We can't understand. We're talking about things like thunderstorms and automobiles when we're a fish. How can we get these things? 
And it's a mystery, you see. Because with that mystery, how our modern culture engages in the whole notion and idea of God actually speaks to this very fact. We tend, as humans, without any kind of spiritual formation, to fall in an error of exaggerating one or the other. We exaggerate the transcendence of God. If we exaggerate the transcendence of God, what we get is like a great watchmaker, a great creator, who made all the world, but prayer doesn't really matter. And the people that believe that are the ones that sneer, oh, save your prayers, you know, say, send money or vote my way or whatever. They sneer at you with this because they don't believe that such a God, even if he exists, cares about you. It's a, called, a, it's called a deism. It's the philosophy of deism. So God exists, but he doesn't really care. He wound it all up, and then it's up to us. It's up to us to build a great world. It's up to us to save the whales. It's up to us to do all this stuff. That is what deism teaches. And deism also teaches there are no miracles. This may surprise some of you, but you know, Muslims don't believe in miracles. They don't believe that God works that way. Their God works that way. And it's fascinating, you know? Catholics believe in miracles. Not all Christians believe in miracles. Our evangelical brothers and sisters do. But there's a whole middle group of what we call modernists, which include some Catholics, and include all the mainstream Protestant churches. They don't believe in miracles at all. They believe it's all symbolic. That this story that I just told you in today's Holy Gospel, that I announce, sure it happened, but it happened spiritually. Sure the resurrection happened, <coughs> spiritually. Sure the Red Sea parted, but you know what, it was just a nice wind, it blew the water <laughs> into the reeds. <laughs> Honestly, what do you do with such people? I don't, I don't understand, why do you come to Sunday? Why do you even bother getting out of bed for that? To me, that is a, a faith dead, dead. Why do I mention the Muslims? See, because they say that you can please their God and that God doesn't owe anything back or doesn't, doesn't speak to us in any way other than their own prophet. Isn't that interesting? Mm. See, a Catholic believes something very different. We believe in what's called the communion of the saints. We believe that all of us, Moses, Elias, your great-grandmother, your deceased spouse or child, has a connection with you in the relationship that you have that God in his mercy has given you. That when word made flesh, so I talked about the transcendence of God and how we can exaggerate it. But here's the, the strange thing for a Christian to get. So imagine then God could become that fish and now he's in time. And there's a lot of weird and wonderful things that happen here. The miss are original and noticed, but it's so neat when you're aware of it, it changes everything. So word made flesh and the Annunciation, which we celebrate shortly, God and the second person of the Trinity assumed a human nature. He was fully God, fully human. He wasn't just a holy prophet. He wasn't just some some great, you know, happy hippie that, that lived in the in the time of the Hebrew. He was Word made flesh, God. And that's a big deal. That God from outside of time pierces time. He dwells, not only does he become one of his creations, he dwells in the environment of his creation. He eats as we do. He coughs as we do. He cuts his hand working on a wood project. You know, people know, oh, that wouldn't happen. He's got, wrong. He took on a human nature, and guess what? Making a mistake does not diminish his perfection in one bit as it pertains to him being God. And so the thing is, is this world, like I say, we can exaggerate the transcendence of God. And when you have friends who talk about that, they'll say things like, well, if there's a heaven, you know, I didn't kill anybody, maybe I'll get there, right? If a God exists. I'm just going to have to take them off, right? And that's the majority of the people we know. And then, on the other extreme, there are the people that emphasize the imminence of God. In other words, they try to make God very human. They try to make God into, oh, you know, if our Lord, if our Lord lived today, he'd be founding a goodwill or a, or a salvation army. That's what he'd do. He'd be 
having you know, all these people come far and wide to get the best soup in the land. What do I do with these people? It's one extreme or the other. And the answer, in part, is to reflect on this beautiful gospel for which you have heard. God spoke. Our Lord was transfigured. Peter, James, John were there as witnesses. They saw the connection between the Old and the New Testaments. They saw the power of God saying, listen to my son. And then poor Peter, and Peter's like us in the story, because we all be tempted to do the same, you know. Here, let me, let me do it for you, God. Let me build you tents. Wouldn't this be great? This is awesome. We're going to hang out with the prophets. Let's build tents. And he doesn't get it. He doesn't get it because God was transfigured our Lord visibly, but he was also calling us to be transfigured. Us to stop thinking like a goldfish. To stop thinking that God's up there winding up our clock and doesn't care about us until we're gone. Or that, on the opposite extreme, that he's some sort of social worker. Because that's not true. Well, what is true? You see, when he rejected the tent, he rejected the imminence. He rejected this notion that you're going to fix things just on this earth. And so, we have this beautiful reading from St. Paul to the Thessalonians that connects how you are to look at this. And this is what Paul says. Even as you have learned from us how you ought to walk to please God. In other words, he gives you the recipe. As indeed you are walking. As indeed you and I have a long way to go. Because no matter where you are in your spiritual life, as much as you have been given, more will be expected. So some of you have more faith than others. Good for you. But guess what? A different call is given to you. And some of you have more patience than one other. Well, guess what? You're meant to use that virtue for a better good. Some of you are more charitable. Some of you are smarter. Some of you can speak. Some of you can read. Some of you can do marvelous acts of creation, make things in your backyard and fix stuff that will confound me. And that's beautiful because God has given us all these different gifts, but all of these gifts are meant to not just stay here in the now. They're meant to be somehow an act of praise to him. They're to be transfigured. They are to be changed. They are to be seen in a new life. And we know, you know, people, we want to make our own rules. Oh, you know, I like being Catholic. I've done a mass. But, you know, that little rule, that thing, they're a little old fashioned here and they're a little old fashioned. What is wrong with these people? I don't know what to do. All I can do is is, is share the word of God and the teaching of the church. But you see, this isn't about some old guys with beards making up rules for you and me. This is about God himself speaking to a world, entering time, entering into that world of that little aquarium so that we can have a glimmer of what's outside and what's more, understand that what the world awaits us beyond is far more fantastic than we can understand in this aquarium. Far more. We'll never be bored. We'll never be unhappy. We'll never have pain and suffering again. But with that comes the obligation to walk in his way. Because God will not save us against our will no matter how much we wish that was different. And so Paul says, we beseech and exhort you in the Lord Jesus to make even greater progress. Some of us have been away from the faith at different parts of our life. And we've come back. And we've come back with sorrow. We go to the sacrament of confession and we say... Lord Jesus, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And you know what? God can use that. God can take that and make you a great saint. But you know what he can't do? Oh, well, you know, I didn't kill anybody. I didn't steal anything, so I guess I'm okay. I guess I'll find out. <laughs> I can't do anything with that. My goodness. And you know, sometimes it's because it's a cultural thing. Some people are afraid of priests. Why are they afraid of priests? Well, bad sense of humor sometimes, but why, why are they afraid of priests? They're afraid of priests because they figure if they get the last rites or they get the extreme unction, you know, the sick as the, the, the new folks call it, 
that is going to be it. I'm done. Priest came. You call the priest. Why do you call the priest your house? He comes when someone's dying. Little wonder. You, the little kids have seen this growing up. They were a little kid 80 years ago, and they saw that growing up. The only time the priest comes over, it's the it's the mark of death. You'd be scared of a priest too. But here's the thing: the sacraments, every single one of them, are real miracles, as real as the miracle that you heard today in the Holy Gospel. And they're transformative. They change things. They have spiritual efficacy. In other words, they do stuff. Receiving the Blessed Sacrament does stuff. It changes you. Either for the better or for the worse. If you're not predisposed to receive him, it's for the worse. If you are predisposed to receive him, it's for the better. The Sacrament of Reconciliation changes you. The anointing of the saint changes you. Sometimes, sometimes it restores people. Sometimes it heals them. So why be afraid of it? Why would you turn away God's miraculous intervention, baptism, confirmation, holy orders? Those three sacraments change the soul indelibly. They actually mark the soul, not just here, but in eternity. And we have we've become so used to cheapening this and making it seem like just some sort of human ritual. And Paul says, he exhorts you in our Lord Jesus to make even greater progress. This is what Lent is for. And my goodness, if you don't want to give something up, then don't. Add something. Add a decade of the rosary. Do something. Add an examination of conscience before you go to bed. Just do something so that you're able to see Easter with a new light. It will transform you if you ask him to. And Paul says that this is the will of God. Your sanctification, that you, our job here on earth, is to become saints. Not on our own steam, but his steam. It's the blood of our Lord Jesus that makes us saints. But again, he can't do that unless we obey him, obey his will, try to seek his truth. And Paul says something else interesting. He says that every one of you learn to possess his vessel in holiness and honor. Wow. Do you not see? I've said this before, so I'm just going to repeat it. Your baptism, your confirmation made you a vessel. Like the chalice made you a vessel. And in this vessel dwells the Holy Ghost if you are in the state of grace. When God dwells in you, you are his temple. And you are able to see the world as God sees it, or at least closer to how he sees it. You are able to see with the eyes of the spirit, not the flesh. You are able to hear with the ears of the spirit and not of the flesh. And this requires right relationship with God and reverence of his holy gift, word made flesh. If he dignified human dignity, to say you are more than a goldfish, you're more than a worm, you're more than dust, then your response to that great love is to live a life worthy of that holy gift, to live a life worthy of being the heir to a king and not messing around with trivialities. He says, possess, everyone must possess themselves in holiness and not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. And the thing is with that is, it's easy to get caught up and think, when we're talking about lust, we're simply talking about what we see in the billboards of Highway 19 or whatever. What he's actually talking as well about anything in the world that you give attachment to that keeps you away from him. The Lord is the avenger of all these things, as we have told you before, and testify, for he has not called us into uncleanliness, but to holiness. And it doesn't get any more clear than that. So whenever I hear someone say, oh, well, if there's God, I didn't kill anybody, I didn't steal anything, I guess I'm okay. I, I, I feel not sick, but I feel very disappointed and saddened. Because I'd much rather have somebody living a wild life and doing all kinds of things that are against the catechism and they have a great big long scroll. But you know what happens with somebody like that? If they have a good heart in them, they hit the wall and they come back and they go to confession and they come before our Lord and they say, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. And you know what? Those people are restored no matter what they've done. 
they're restored if, they're asked, if the request for forgiveness is true. But if it's true, guess what? It's transformative. It changes stuff. And I'm going to give you one last little, one last little connection that I invite you to look at. The choice of the apostles that our Lord took them, took with him. Peter, whom he founded the church upon. John, who stood at the foot of the cross with our blessed mother, the only apostle not to run away, the only apostle not to be martyred. And the author, not only the Gospel of John, but the book of the Apocalypse of Revelation. And finally, James. And James is an interesting one because it is ancient legend in the church that St. James himself appeared to lead the Spanish armies in battle against the Muslim invader that they were overrun. And he appeared and, well, Spain, at least for centuries, was Christian again. And we are coming to a part of the world when even our own churchmen, even our own church teachers, are telling you that miracles haven't happened, and the real miracle is the soup kitchen, and the real miracle is sharing with one another, and the real miracle is not offending anybody. And I tell you most solemnly that our Lord says quite the opposite. He said two things that should underline what's going to happen here. The first thing is, he said, when the Son of Man returns, will he find on earth any faith? And I would suggest he will not. And the second thing that he said, that's counter to this message, is he said, do not think I came to bring peace to this earth, but a sword to separate father and daughter, brother and sister, essentially friend and friend. And that's happened already in your lifetime right now. You live in the United States of America in the last 10 years, you've probably lost friends. You've probably lost family in the sense of close intimacy because of what you believe. And I tell you most solemnly that God himself will help you. He will help you discern the truth. But it doesn't happen from talk radio and it doesn't happen from reading fancy news articles. You know what it happens? It happens on your knees in your bedroom or before this tabernacle. And you listen to him. You listen to him because I tell you most solemnly this era will see great signs and wonders as it is not seen in centuries because as the faith is decreasing, his grace is also increasing. He gives us great hope. And as much as the teaching can be hard for us sometimes, it's also meant to encourage you that all this stuff is real and it all has, if we remain in this friendship, a very happy and profound ending. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, 